Everybody wants to fix the NBA All-Star Game. The All-Star Game is not the problem. Basketball is the problem. Basketball's dead. LeBron James, David Stern, they killed basketball. I'll explain today. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I'm Jason Whitlock, your host. Thank you for joining me. Happy Monday. Uh, this episode is brought to you by our friends at Good Ranchers. Fall in love with beef, chicken, and seafood all over again by subscribing at GoodRanchers.com. Use my promo code FEARLESS to get $240 in free bacon with your order. What could be better than that? Good Ranchers and bacon, Applewood smoked bacon. So awesome to have Good Ranchers back on board because they help me do monos and fire starters like this and do shows like this. Shamika Michelle, Steve Kim are going to join us today. Uh, let's get to our fire. Adam Silver can't save the NBA or men's basketball. It's dead. Sunday's NBA All-Star Game was just the latest in a decade-long series of obituaries detailing the tragic passing of American hoops. Despite a promise to deliver a more competitive All-Star game, Sunday's contest may have been the worst in history. In a game that featured 168 three-point attempts, the East beat the West 211 to 186. No one tried, no one competed. The players sauntered up and down the court, jacked up threes and moved out of the way as players dunked. The fans in the stands spent more time gossiping than cheering. One of the players said the highlight of the night was a group of entertainers dunking with the help of trampolines between the third and fourth quarters. The truth is, NBA All-Star Weekend peaked on Thursday when football legend turned podcaster Shannon Sharp and comedian Mike Epps settled their beef. Men's basketball is dead. Adam Silver cannot resuscitate what is what his predecessor, Commissioner David Stern, killed. Yes, David Stern killed American basketball. At the behest of Nike, Stern focused the game on international growth in general and pleasing China in particular. The modern, non-competitive, woke NBA is a byproduct of globalism. In pursuit of more and more money, the NBA scrapped its American identity and values. It turned itself into a platform for the expression of anti-American sentiment, entitlement, victimhood, and narrative over authenticity. The NBA's marketing strategy the past two decades has been, tune in to watch LeBron James and other tall black men overcome racism they never experienced. The marketing is not just a turnoff to conservative sports fans. No, it's much worse than that. It convinces the players they're victims. It creates a sense of entitlement among the alleged competitors. How do you go from Michael Jordan playing all 82 regular season games in nine of his 15 seasons to having to beg players to play 65? Well, you create an anti-American culture that seduces multimillionaires into believing they're victims of racist capitalists. The NBA's desire to be popular in China baited the league into embracing messaging that denigrates American culture, the American work ethic. The Chinese Communist Party, no different from Cold War communism, loves to promote that America is a bastion for anti-black racism. Every time LeBron James claims American black men are hunted like animals, his popularity in China soars and his attitude toward American sports fans diminishes. No American sports league has a more hostile relationship with its fan base than the NBA. The players routinely beef with fans. It's not just Russell Westbrook. The players instruct security to toss fans from the arena. Michael Jordan felt a duty to serve and entertain fans. Modern players struggle to tolerate fans. The players, they're elites. They look down on the very people who love them. The players believe the fans owe them. Adam Silver can't fix this. His best efforts are failing. 
The in-season tournament to start the basketball calendar failed. It was a gimmick. The Lakers won it. They're the ninth best team in the West. The expanded playoffs and play-in games have rendered the regular season pointless. Seven game series make it nearly impossible for a lower seed to pull off an upset. The NBA is a gossip and narrative league. The greatest competition is among individual player groupies for Jordan, LeBron, and Kobe and a never ending argument about their standing in the all time great debate. The only way to fix American basketball is to shut down the NBA for a year or two and force a new system and pay structure on the players. 20 years ago, the NHL locked out its players for an entire season and radically changed its pay system. The NBA needs a similar fix. The league needs to work toward attaching a significant portion of pay to wins and losses. To avoid players stacking rosters, each roster spot would have a specific value 1 to 15 and the highest value player would earn more per win than the players ranked below him on the roster. For example, LeBron James might be ranked number one on the Lakers roster and Anthony Davis number two. LeBron hypothetically would earn 200,000 per victory and Anthony Davis would earn 175,000. The other major adjustment the league should make is raising the age limit to 21. Because of name, image, and likeness, college players can now earn significant money. It would be much better for American basketball if players stayed in college three or four years, learned how to compete, and brought established brands to the NBA. The NBA needs a revolutionary war and makeover. Adam Silver is not the right leader for this war. He's a peacetime consigliere. He's not built for the kind of upheaval necessary to fix the NBA. I've been watching everybody talk about NBA All-Star Weekend. From Bill Simmons, he put out a video, hey, eliminate the three-point line, to David Aldridge, and these are guys I respect a lot, David Aldridge, but I, hey, this game is irredeemable. They're missing the bigger picture. It's not the All-Star game. The All-Star game is a reflection of the entire season of what the NBA has devolved into. These guys don't want to compete. The, the whole competitive spirit that defined America has been eviscerated by globalism and by corporations controlled by diversity, equity, and inclusion, corporations that don't believe in merit, corporations that are slaves to the international market and don't respect American values, the American identity, the American work ethic. Our entire culture has been destroyed through globalism through a bunch of people sitting around going, oh my God, it's so much better in France. It's so much better in Europe. It's so much better here. It's so much better there. None of them want to move. All the people that think, oh, America, it's so racist. None of them want to move. They don't want to go back to Africa. They don't want to go back to Italy. They don't want to go back to Ireland. They just want to complain because they've been bought and paid for. Academia has been bought and paid for by China and all these other foreign influencers who are preaching a steady message that America is a bastion of evil and wickedness and exploitation and this oppressor versus oppressed narrative, all of that stuff. And the NBA players caught up in it and other professional athletes caught up in their leagues promoting this type of mentality. Well, that mentality ends up infecting the actual players, kills their motivation, and kills their respect, loyalty, and allegiance to the people actually sitting in the stands, to the people sitting at home watching the product. They hate their fans, and so they serve up their fans bad product. It's a relationship. Imagine being in a marriage 
where one of the spouses hates the other spouse. Do you think that spouse serves the other spouse appropriately when they hate them? You think the man or woman that's cheating on his or her spouse gives their best in any capacity to their, to their spouse when they actually hate them and they're cheating on them? And that's what the NBA and basketball has been doing to American basketball fans for three decades. They've been cheating on you. They've been cheating on us. They've been courting China and all these other places around the globe. And they're sir and they've watched us get served doo-doo sandwiches and say, oh man, this tastes just like what Magic Johnson and Larry Bird were serving. Now I know they, they were serving filet mignon, but this doo-doo that LeBron and this group are serving, man, it almost tastes like filet mignon. Oh God, I can remember when Michael Jordan used to serve up a seven course meal, top of the line. And now uh, LeBron and these guys serve up burgers and fries. And we ain't talking about in and out burger. They're serving White Castle and telling you that it's a seven course meal and it tastes the exact same as Mike, what Michael Jordan was serving at his restaurant 82 nights a year. And, and the media, all in on it, all this worship. And the, this is why this show is important, and it's why I'm out of step. And it's how it speaks to how brainwashed you all have been, and many sports fans have been. That they listen to me actually hold the athletes to a standard and demand that the athletes respect fans and carry themselves in a way that, that elevates the game and oh, Whitlock's the bad guy. And the groupies, the people that are bending over backwards and convincing you, oh man, LeBron James doing you a favor playing 70 games. He's in his 20th year, and he's playing 70 games. Oh, we've never seen this before. And I just love LeBron James. And oh, please watch, I'm the biggest LeBron groupie there ever was. Michael Jordan at age 40, or 39 or whatever, his last year in Washington, the man played 82 games. Nine times in his career, he played 82 games. Three or four other times, he played 80 or more games. Michael Jordan served steak every night. Michael Jordan's from a two-parent family. Michael Jordan, whether people liked it or not, whether the quote is accurate or not, when he said Republicans buy sneakers too, which maybe he didn't even say. But bottom line, he said, I'm not getting involved in that political BS that y'all want to drag me into. I'm going to get these shots off. I'm going to play these games and I'm going to sell these shoes. And I'm going to leave all that divisive politics to you clowns. And so now all the clowns are in the NBA. They're in the NFL. And they're all promoting the same politics, the same political narrative that China and our foreign people uh, the, the foreign, our foreign adversaries want promoted. America's evil. And, and particularly as it relates to these black athletes, and you're owed something. Yes, I know you're making $20, $30 million a year. Yes, I know you're taking care of your family and friends and you're living your best life, but damn it, you're owed something because 150 years ago, there was some racism that you never experienced and you're owed something for it. People that feel that kind of entitlement, just, just think of your own workplace, your own work environment. The person that shows up on the assembly line or at the PR firm or at the doctor's office or as a mailman, the person that shows up with an entitled mindset does he give the same effort as someone who doesn't feel entitled? Absolutely not. Entitlement is a poison. It's a cancer of the mind. And the NBA and basketball have that cancer. It's not just the all-star game.
Steve Kim's going to join us here in a second. We'll talk some more. We'll delve deeper into it uh, with Steve Kim. But this NBA thing, it speaks to the entire American culture. It's not just a basketball thing. And this is why I love talking about sports. One, because I understand sports. But two, it's an easy way for me to explain to you what's going on in the rest of society. These issues are so much bigger than just basketball. But these basketball players have an entire mindset, and you can see the problems that it causes. Everybody's now in agreement. Hey, you got to do away with the NBA All-Star game. We've already done away with the NFL uh, Pro Bowl. The NFL ain't what it used to be. The NBA certainly isn't what it used to be. Uh, Steve Kim's going to join us here in a second to further that discussion. Shamika Michelle, we're going to attack her on the bottom of it because I want to talk about C.J. Stroud <laughs> and him running around with Amber Rose. Uh, before I go any further, though, guys, I want to talk to you about uh, our great friends at Preborn. Because of you, Preborn's network of clinics saw over 58,000 babies saved. Thank you to all who made this possible. Let's celebrate these precious babies. Daisy and her husband had decided they never wanted kids. When she found out she was pregnant, she immediately thought about abortion. But after she and her husband met her baby on ultrasound and heard the heartbeat, their hearts melted and they chose life. Her baby, Jeffrey, is healthy and beautiful. Daisy and her husband can't even imagine life without him. These babies are truly miraculous. And every day, Preborn celebrates 200 miracles, $28 a month, can be the difference between life and death of a child. When a mother meets her baby on ultrasound and hears their heartbeat, it's a divine connection that doubles a baby's chance at life. Let's join together and help mothers choose life. Just dial pound 250 and say the keyword baby. That's pound 250 keyword baby. Or give the way I prefer to give. Go to preborn.com slash fearless. That's preborn.com slash fearless. Send me an email after you do, and you definitely uh, want to send me an email about your plans to join us. Preborn is sponsoring this year's Roll Call 2.0. Uh, our theme for this year is Growth Requires Sacrifice. Uh, Roll Call 2.0 is this summer, June 1st, right back here in Nashville, Tennessee at Rocket Town. Make sure you get your tickets right now at fearlessarmyrollcall.com. Again, that's fearlessarmyrollcall.com. For those of you that are church leaders or pastors, and you want to sponsor some members of yours coming here in mass, we have special discounted rates for you. Go to fearlessarmyrollcall.com. We need you here in Nashville. This, this event's going to be bigger and better this week. I promise you we'll start announcing uh, and putting on the website some of the people, some of the speakers that have agreed to come and join us. Roll Call 2.0, Friday, May 31st, special VIP event. Saturday, June 1st, we'll be at Rocket Town with our all-day event, Roll Call 2.0. It's a men's summit. Men, come out, be inspired, learn, let's fellowship together, let's get together and talk about the sacrifices we need to make in order to restore this American culture, in order to promote a culture that's more consistent with our biblical values. There's sacrifices we need to make. Our ancestors made great sac sacrifices to create this freedom that we've taken for granted. All right, don't go anywhere. Steve Kim next. Hello, Fearless Army. I'm Jason Whitlock, your leader. I'm going to spend 2024 discussing growth and sacrifice. Hard times are here. Harder times are coming. What has stopped American growth and caused a regression in fundamental freedoms and values? A lack of sacrifice. Our ancestors sacrificed for our benefit. We have not sacrificed to protect the progress they died for. No sacrifice, no freedom. What impedes man's willingness to sacrifice? His ignorance, his perversion, his pride, his ingratitude, and his cowardice, his rejection of God. The Bible is a story about the power and the necessity of sacrifice. Sacrifice is the sun, rain, and fertilizer of growth. Growth is our life purpose. Grow in the knowledge, wisdom, fear, obedience, and reverence to the Most High. Growth requires sacrifice will be our theme for Roll Call 
2.0 this summer, June 1, right back here in Nashville. We're excited to welcome you. Let me spend a minute explaining what G-R-O-W-T-H actually stands for, for us in the Fearless Army. The G is for game plan. In order to properly grow, it's essential we work from the strategic game plan spelled out in the Bible. The R, responsibility. As we grow as men, we understand and accept our responsibilities to God, family, and teammates. The O, ownership. We embrace ownership of our destiny. Outsiders do not determine our fate. The W, wisdom. We honor, value, and share the wisdom imparted to us by elders, coaches, and leaders. The T, trust. We must be worthy of trust. The reliability of a man's word defines him far more than popularity and material possession. The H, humility. The reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and light. That's straight from Proverbs 22 and four. Come join us in Nashville as we talk about growth and sacrifice and how without sacrifice, there will be no growth. Roll Call 2.0, right here in Nashville, Saturday, June 1st. History, economics, the great works of literature, the meaning of the U.S. Constitution. Did you study these things in school? Probably not. Or even if you did, maybe it's time for a refresher. Time and technology have changed a lot of things, but they have not changed basic fundamental truths about the world and our place in it. That's why I'm so excited that Hillsdale College is offering more than 40 free online courses in the most important and enduring subject. You can learn about the works of C.S. Lewis, the stories of the book of Genesis, the meaning of the U.S. Constitution, the rise and fall of the Roman Republic, or the history of the ancient Christian church with Hillsdale College's online course all available for free. That's right, free. I personally recommend you sign up for Ancient Christianity. In this 11 lecture course, you'll study the inspiring stories of Christ, his apostles, and faithful ones throughout the first four centuries of Christianity. You'll also learn the arguments of key early Christian apologists who defended the Christian faith in the face of persecution. The course is self-paced so that you can start whenever and wherever. Enroll now in ancient Christianity to discover the improbable and miraculous story of Christianity. Go right now to hillsdale.edu slash fearless. That's hillsdale.edu slash fearless to enroll. There's no cost and it's easy to get started. That's hillsdale.edu slash fearless to register. Hillsdale.edu slash fearless. All right, time for some Steve Kim, some Korean Cosell. Uh, Cosell, uh, everybody's talking about the NBA uh, mm -hmm. All-Star Game, 211 to 186, the East wins. Uh, but everybody's taking a dump on it, and everyone's offering suggestions on. I just watched some video Bill Simmons put out. He says, eliminate the three-pointer. That'll fix the All-Star Game. Uh, David Aldridge tweeted out that, Look, I don't even know if this game is salvageable, the All-Star game. Steve, I think they're limiting the problem. The problem is much bigger than the NBA All-Star game. The NBA All-Star game is just a reflection of the product the NBA is putting out. It's a worse version. It's a worse reflection of the product. But they got a basketball problem, not just an NBA All-Star game problem. NBA action. It's not fantastic. I mean, David Stern must be rolling over in his grave. But, Jason, I go further. I think what is going on with the NBA and its all-star game is not just reflective of basketball or pro sports, but of society. We have enabled this type of behavior where there's a sense of entitlement, where people want more uh, or want more for doing less. I mean, I think it was Jalen Brown who said in one of those press conferences about that 65-game mandatory requirement to have certain NBA distinctions like the MVP or first-team All-Star. And this guy said, well, God, I mean, 60, well, shouldn't it be more like 58? I'm like, Jalen, you play basketball for a living. 
We're not even asking you to play 82 games anymore. We're asking you to play 65. There's no other job in America, Jason, that I know of. And if there is one, please uh, send me over the application where they're immediately telling you off the bat, hey, buddy, if you don't want to play about 20% of these games, it's still good. Think about any other job that would tell you, you know what? If you want to take a couple of Tuesdays off each month, throw in a Wednesday, you know what? Just take off a whole Friday. No one else would reward it. But again, this is an erosion of what has taken place. It's that old phrase, how did this come to be? How did this happen? It was gradual, and then it was sudden. Because once we started not placing importance on regular season games, and then we started to acquiesce to load management, and then it became about player empowerment, then it became players becoming social uh, justice advocates instead of athletes, you give them an inch, and now, Jason, they took 94 feet. This is what has happened. Steve, I completely agree with you. It is a reflection of a softening society, doesn't value work. Again, I mean, I, I make it the biggest issue in terms of like globalism. Uh, America used to be defined by our great work ethic. Yeah. And now everybody is convinced, no, as Americans, we work too hard over in Europe or in this country or that country. They only have six-hour work days. They only uh, work 30 hours in a week. They all, you know, everything's always better someplace else, and we should be doing what some other country is doing. That's what has happened to our work ethic. And so everybody sees work as basically as exploitation, not a responsibility, <laughs> or so, and particularly you're talking about a game. Uh, you know, you get paid all that money for playing a game, but, but you know, you're exploited because they're asking you to work too hard. I mean, Jason, it's amazing. Some of these same players will probably one day tell you about how they are not capitalists and it's an evil uh, system. Uh, meanwhile, they're probably making $45, $50 million a year, okay? They're anti-capitalist. A lot of these um, celebrities and athletes, when it's convenient, but they're not in reality, okay? Um I only watched about 20 minutes of the NBA All-Star coverage this year, and that's because on Friday night, I was waiting for the ESPN top rank fights to start. And the NBA celebrity game actually seeped over into the boxing coverage because, quite frankly, I, I was there to watch Bruce Shushu Carrington, who put on a great show, and I'm kind of watching a little bit just to monitor, like, I hope this thing does not go into double overtime. But, Jason, you know what's sad? Based on what I saw on Friday night and some of the clips I saw on Twitter, because I did not watch a single second of that monstrosity yesterday, the celebrities played harder than the NBA players. I found that to be sad. And again, I'm a child of the 80s. I know I'm an old guy now, and I embrace it. I am now the Korean curmudgeon. I don't care. I'm not changing. You know, I hearken back to 1984, that All-Star game in Denver. And that's when the NBA reinstituted the slam dunk contest. And I still remember Larry Nance pulling this big up upset by defeating Julius Irving. And it was a big deal. And then as that weekend, which used to be centered around Saturday afternoon, uh, I mean, I just have so many great memories. Spud Webb pulling one of the great upsets of all time. It was um, David beating Dominique in the 86 slam dunk contest. I remember the 88 slam dunk contest in Chicago. I'm still not sure Jordan really beat Dominique Wilkins. That looked like a hometown decision. Larry Bird walking into the three-point contest and telling these guys in the locker room, all right, which one of you bums is playing for second? People took it seriously. And Jason, uh, on my YouTube feed yesterday, highlights and clips of the 87 All-Star game came up on my feed and I watched it. And I'll never forget, it was Rolando Blockman of the D Dallas Mavericks hitting two free throws with no time remaining to put the game into overtime. And it felt like a playoff game at that point. And then Tom Chambers in front of his hometown fans in Seattle took home the MVP because the player said, you know what, Tom, this is your weekend. And Magic made sure, like, hey, Tom, let's get this win. Let's get this award. And there was a certain pride. And I still remember Kobe playing awfully hard in these games because it mattered to him. Allen Iverson did the same thing. To see what it's devolved into now, really, I think it's sad, Jason. 
Steve, I want to go another angle or cut deeper or just another layer to this. My argument, Steve, is that David Stern bears some responsibility. He yeah. and Nike and their focus on international audience and making this a global game. And, and there's an underlying message to all of that. And that's that uh, the fans here in the arena don't matter. And so 30 years of pursuing a global sport and a contract in China, 30 years of just subtle messaging that the fans don't matter, the players now hate the fans. They do. And so Michael Jordan went from servicing the fans, playing 82 games nine times in a 15-year career. I think he played 80 or more 12 or 13 times during his 15-year career. It was all about servicing, pleasing the fan in the stands. And now when I look at NBA players, they're getting fans tossed out of the arena. Russell Westbrook's fighting with fans every chance he can get. Go all the way back to the malice in the palace and the way the, the players, the, so the customer, the fan doesn't matter. And so that's why the product and what they're serving the fan, it doesn't matter. The, the thing's been flipped upside down. The athletes feel like, they're doing fans a favor just with their presence. Jason, I always love to talk about Michael Jordan because I, I think just he's fascinating and he's the greatest athlete I'm ever going to see. And I'm good with that. The most amazing statistic for me, now that I think about it, is not the point score. It's not the stuff he did in Chicago. But I believe in his last year with half a knee, on one leg in Washington. He was a broken down, but still very good version of himself. If you look at the numbers, I think he played every game. And, and there's that old saying from Joe DiMaggio that I know Michael Jordan subscribed to. He said, I have a responsibility every time I go out there to give my best possible effort because there's someone in there, in that audience that's never seen me before, that's paying a lot of money, that's saved up, that's sacrificed to see me. I just, here's the thing that gets me, Jason. If they would have load managed and had this attitude in the eighties throughout the magic bird, Clyde Drexler, Charles Barkley, Ewing, Olajuwon, Jordan era, the game would not be as popular as it ended up becoming because we understood and they understood, Hey, for as many games as possible up to 82, we will try to play every single game. I still, one of my favorite Jordan stories is, one time he had a turf toe, and his trainer, the team trainer, said, look, Michael, we got two options here. You can wear a bigger shoe, but your movements are going to be very cumbersome. You're going to be a little clunky in your movements, or we can wear an extra tight shoe that's going to wrap your toe, but there's going to be a lot of pain when you cut. But you're going to be able to be more or less yourself, but again, there's a lot of pain. He goes, you know what? Give me the bigger shoe. I'm good. First quarter starts. He doesn't like the way he's playing. He probably thinks he's robbing the fans and his team and himself of being Michael Jordan. First television timeout comes. Jordan goes right to that train. goes, hey, come here. Give me the pain. Again, there was an honor to what they did. And there's an honor, in my view, in everyday life, of doing your job. Look, I don't expect these guys to be Cal Ripken, Randy Smith, or A.C. Green. I get it. It's a different time and place. But, Jason, I have a question. At what point did it become oppressive to play the game of basketball for millions of dollars. When and why? When I'm telling you the whole mindset of the NBA, the entire culture, they're all preaching from LeBron James on down, uh, hey, this country's racist and it takes advantage of you. And ev eventually that slips into your thinking and your worldview and you look out, oh my God, they're requiring me to do something. How dare they? How I got to play 82 games. How dare they? I'm oppressed. Uh, every time an athlete, a professional athlete making millions of dollars, makes the analogy to slavery, and that's been going on in athletics even long before Colin Kaepernick. Athletes have been comfortable making that analogy, and people have been comfortable allowing them to get away with it. It just breeds itself into this mindset of entitlement and, and that's where I'm looking at people from Bill Simmons to other, we got to fix the game. And, you know, David Aldridge, who, you know, 
covered the NBA for TNT, now works for The Athletic and still very associated with the NBA. You know, he tweets out, that was dreadful. Again, mm. I'm beginning to think the game is irredeemable. I'm not sure mm. why they even why even minimal defensive effort is beyond this generation of all-stars, but it may be time to end this game if they can't give more of a damn than that. Yeah. Uh, this is bigger than just this game, though, is my issue, Steve. They ha This laissez-faire attitude is all over the regular season, and hell, it's even part of the postseason at this point. Yeah. Jason, I think last night I sent that tweet from David Aldridge. And I, I did that because that's alarming because David Aldridge is a guy that I really respect. That's an NBA lifer. Knows the game of basketball, knows the culture. I think he's a very reputable journalist who's very fair. But when you lose a guy like him, and he's using the word irredeemable, because I've lost my interest in basketball. He makes his living in it. And I said, wait a minute. If you start to lose the David Aldridge's of the world as a league, and Dreamers Pro that you've referenced the last couple of years, uh, weeks, Charles Shabransky, he was disgusted. Yeah. And he he actually did a poll of, did you like that All-Star game? And I think like 90% of the people said it was a monstrosity. It was a joke. People hated it. But I, I do wonder, though, Jason, let's be honest. How many of these same journalists, and I'm not talking about David Aldridge, how many of these same writers and announcers and people that covered this game that are now griping about what's going on. How many times in the last 12 years do you think they push for player empowerment and push for players' rights and were advocating that, hey, these guys need rest? Never mind the private jets, the chartered jets, the four-star hotels. Never mind, uh, you know, they actually stayed at four-star hotels every single time, never had to carry a bag. How many of them were actually advocating and pushing for this for the past decade? Well, the chickens have come home to roost there, Whitlock. Mm -mm. I like and respect David Aldridge. I want to be clear with that. I like and respect David Aldridge, have known him throughout my entire career. My problem is these problems have been so evident for so long that I think everybody coming out now, including Bill Simmons, who, I, you know, everybody, Bill Simmons was my favorite sports columnist of all time. I like and respect Bill Simmons. But it's like they had to be given permission by Adam Silver to mm. criticize the NBA. Yes. He's told them, hey, we can criticize the NBA All-Star game. And so everybody's running to do it. But where the game is at and where the All-Star game and the whole league, that's been clear as day for easily a decade, two decades, if you're really honest about it. And no one said a word until Adam Silver, now that he's fed up with the All-Star game. Yes. Everybody feels liberated and feel like they can actually say what they really think. Steve, I I'm telling you, yeah. I started writing about this, I believe, in 2008. If you don't mm. figure out a way in all professional sports, but particularly in the NBA where this entitlement mindset really lives, if you don't find a way to attach half of their money to wins and losses where they again if a guy's making 30 million dollars if you give him a base salary of 15 and then he has another 15 million he can earn based on wins in the regular season and post I think that's very fair and that's the only yeah. way you're going to restore some integrity to these games Jason a few highlights that I saw that game yesterday it looked like the pro bowl but with a basketball hoop I mean, that's how little effort they gave. And I'm like, come on. Is it, here's the thing that's interesting. I wonder, and I, and I read your column. Do you think the owners are now hoping and plotting a doomsday scenario that maybe there's such a rebellion, the fans stop showing up? And this is key. The fans have to do their part. Just don't bitch and moan online. Now you got to do the next part. Do not support this product. Do not invest your time in it. Do not invest your money. Don't pay for the parking, the concessions. Don't go to the games. And don't turn on NBA on regardless of what network. Because if you're that insulted by it, you cannot be a part of the problem by continuing to ride the express. As for the media, you're absolutely right. Because if they did not write about this at all for the past 10 to 12 years, I guess the term you could say is it was a taciturn endorsement. But I do wonder. Do you think the owners are hoping for a lockout that they're hoping like, okay, good, let's 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 fan the flames here of discontent from the fans and the public. 
and let's hope for the lockout, and now we can squeeze them. I, I, I really, because I actually agree with your theory. Let's have a lockout. Let's start this whole thing over again, as Brian Billick once said about in, NFL instant replay. It's time we blow the whole thing up. Steve, I think you make a great point that I hadn't considered that because there is probably a strategy to what Adam Silver is doing. And this entire year right. has been about from the in-season tournament to 65 game minimum for awards. The, the NBA is driving a conversation about, hey, we got a competition problem. We got a competitive issue problem. And, and let's start trying to tweak things to improve the competition, and now they've clearly given the signal to the media, and you guys can write and complain about it without losing access to us. And so they may be trying to stir the pot to a point. They know that LeBron James's career is coming to an end, and you can't convince me that every NBA owner <clears throat> has been happy with right. the LeBron James clutch sports, uh, Rich Paul era of the NBA, there's been too much power ceded to LeBron James and clutch sports and players. The inmates are running the asylum, and ownership probably is frustrated. Well, they're probably running it into the ground, but let's go back to the bubble three, four years ago. Remember that dark time, <laughs> the bubble? Remember the players were this close to actually being real activists, and they were going to actually just say, no. There's too many important things going on beyond basketball in the world that we're going to walk out. And then someone said, okay, here's the problem. If you do that, your collective bargaining agreement goes to nothing and you're going to lose all the rights. We may have to start over. And everyone said, <laughs> bubble on. So it really showed you how weak their activism was. Um, and they understood, oh, no, 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 no. We have all the advantages. We can't give it. It was at that point I said, no NBA player can be taken seriously as a social justice warrior because they had an opportunity. Cause I'll be honest with you. If they would have done that, Jason, I would have really respected that, but they showed their true colors. Cause quite frankly, someone's got to pay for the fourth escalate and the fourth baby mama. And look, there's bills to pay. I get it guys. Here's the other thing, Jason, I've told this story before a couple of years ago. This is how much it has changed in terms of playing games and respecting the consumer. It was one of the years in the late 80s when Pat Riley was still the coach. I think it may have been the 88-89 season, somewhere around that time. The Lakers had basically wrapped up whatever playoff seating that they were going to get. The game did not matter. It was the last game in Portland. So Pat Riley just says, you know what, Magic, Byron, Worthy, uh, especially Kareem, you're out. Don't worry about it. Don't, it's the 82nd game. doesn't even matter. You know, David's turn fined the Lakers about $100,000. They just said, no, 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 you're not doing that. Think about how far we've come from a meaningless 82nd regular season game where the Hayes already in the barn, and David Stern said, no, 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 no. You're getting your guys out there. This matters. Uh, somewhere along the line, Jason, we lost the middle ground here. Steve, I'm going to let you go. Uh, thank you so much. Great job as always. Sure, we'll see you later this week. Uh, you guys don't go anywhere. Uh, Shamika Michelle is going to join me next. And we're going to talk about C.J. Stroud <laughs> and whether or not uh, the enemy, Amber Rose, the Kardashians, have they got their hooks into C.J. Stroud, our heroic Christian quarterback, the rookie of the year in the NFL. Next. That's tough. All right. So That's tough. Tom Brady's not tough. a game manager. Not, not even nothing you ain't want to put beside the GOAT. We call that man the GOAT, not no game manager. What are you talking about? I mean, it's it. <laughs> it don't even fit. That's that's the thing. That's the game they play now. I'm going to say something wild, and then I'm going to wiggle it around and say, you did a 180 on my show. Iggy or Curry? Of everyone on Golden State. Open shot, fate of the universe on the line, or the Martians have the death beam pointed at Earth. You better hit it. 
I want Iguadala. <laughs> I just conceded to him. I say, brother, I misunderstood gay man. Welcome back. Time for some Shamoke Show. Uh, the perfect person uh, for me to talk about this next topic. Uh, have we lost one to the game, Shamika? Uh, C.J. Stroud, uh, the Houston Texans rookie quarterback. Everybody fell in love with him. He had a great season. He's rookie of the year. Uh, he's praising Jesus every time he gets interviewed. Everybody's falling in love with C.J. Stroud. And now uh, there's reports that he spent Super Bowl Sunday in the Kardashian suite uh, in Las Vegas. And now he's been spotted leaving a celebrity softball or, uh, well, let's watch. This, he's leaving some celebrity softball or baseball game uh, with Amber Rose uh, together. Uh, mm, quite a festive week. Uh, 23-year-old rookie quarterback uh, with a 40-year-old 304. Uh, <laughs> quite the interesting combination. H have we lost C.J. Stroud to the game? You know, this is very interesting, and I would say the Cougars are on the prowl because <laughs> this is like the second professional player that I've seen with an older woman in the last month. Uh, you know, we very well could have lost him. You know, I heard that he came or she came out and said she was just getting a ride. But for me, if this is really, you know, a true Christian, abstain from the appearance of evil. And this looks like with this person, you could be going to do something that most of us wouldn't want to see you do, especially with this person. Whole tendencies aside, I watched her on College Hill with my kids, and she has a lot of mental issues that he would have to deal with, just starting from being a mixed race person. Anyone that saw that um, that show, I think, would agree with me. So I think he has to be really careful. He's an eligible bachelor. Any woman probably would be happy to have him. And he needs to really be selective with who he gets with. Maybe he feels like Amber Rose is the person to be seen with. Maybe he had a crush on her when he was younger and she was with Kanye. But I do not think this would be a good person for him to, to link up with not even because of the age difference, but more so just because of what I've seen from her behavior and the, the way she carries herself. This whole thing about she not wanting women to be slut shamed. I think slut should be shamed. And so I don't think her values would line up with his. Not only that, Amber's an atheist. So if he's a Christian, he has to be really careful being out or being around someone who could get him to kind of question his faith. You know, we've seen this with Jezebel and Ahab. Jezebel can't operate without an Ahab spirit. So he needs to be really, really careful dealing with this woman. Mm. Uh, Shamika, you said some very interesting things that I'm going to want you to follow up on. But before I do that, I want to thank our great friends at Cardio Miracle. Want to introduce you guys to a new sponsor that's jumped on board. Uh, Cardio Miracle is a proprietary formula that supports heart health and improved immunity. I've been taking this product for the past few months, and man, am I a believer. I got my brother, I got my family on it. The main ingredient in Cardio Miracle is nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is essential for life and is involved in many critical body, body functions, especially keeping arteries young and flexible. Heart disease remains the number one cause of death in the U.S. for men and women, according to the American Heart Association. Approximately every 40 seconds, someone in the United States will have a myocardial, myocardial infarction. Nitric oxide helps keep blood pressure and cholesterol at healthy levels. It also supports anti-inflammatory response, natural energy, and better recover. Beyond all of that, John Hewlett, the founder, he shares our value. He shares our worldview. He's a fearless soldier. 
I need you guys to support Cardio Miracle because they're supporting us. They're supporting this type of content. Go to CardioMiracle.com slash fearless. There's a 10% discount if you use our promo code and go to uh, uh, cardiomiracle.com slash fearless. 15% discount if you choose to subscribe and save. They also offer a 60-day, no-risk, 100% money-back guarantee. That's cardiomiracle.com slash fearless. Shamika, I want you, and I, and I have some thoughts on this, but I want you to expound on a couple of different things you said. that I, I, I One, we'll start with an easy one. I didn't know she was an atheist. You're a thousand percent positive about that? Well, I definitely know on College Hill, she got upset anytime someone would pray. She said she didn't believe in that and that she wanted to have her, her, she wanted people to respect the fact that she didn't believe in the things that they believed in. There was a guy there who was a Christian, who was a, a professed Christian, and he was constantly praying, constantly talking about God or talking about Jesus, and she completely was against it. So I don't know if she, maybe she believes in the universe, but she's definitely not a Christian, and she was very open and outright about that. The other thing you said on one of these shows, you feel like she's got some issues related to being mixed race. Expound on why do you believe that? Again, from College Hill, uh, she went into detail about how it's been really hard for her being mixed, how she wasn't white enough for white girls, she wasn't black enough for black girls, and how she was bullied a lot coming up in school because of that fact. So she still struggles with the issues that she believes came from that. And so she actually got into a fight on national television with someone because she has all this pent up anger and she felt like the person was, you know, jabbing at her and poking her that the only way she knew how to respond as a grown woman was to fight. And so for me, that's the problem. You know, that type of behavior should be long gone. People can say whatever they want to say to you, but the fact that your conflict resolution skills don't lead you past throwing hands, that says something. That person did not hit her first. That person was not in her face. Amber got completely upset over the words being said and walked past the girl or she she pretended as if she was getting ready to walk past the girl and instead hit her and they started fighting, that right there speaks a lot to the issues that are bottled up within her that I just don't think unless, you know, God has said, hey, go to this woman. I'm going to use you to lead her to Christ. I think he should be very careful that it could, he could be pulled the other way. Yeah. You know what I, I tell people that like, you have to be an expert swimmer before you are prepared to be a lifeguard. Mm -hmm. and, and so you can hop in the water trying to save someone from drowning, and next thing you know, there's two people drowning. And, right. and I get that C.J. Stroud is a professed Christian, but he's young, and I just can't believe he's far enough along in his journey to where he needs to be jumping in and he's going to be a lifeguard for a 40-year-old 304, just period, end of story. And so that, that – because here's the options as a Christian man. If we want to go with an innocent explanation, he's just giving her a ride. You know, he's being very Christian. Her ride left early, and he's just giving her a ride. Well, he's a multimillionaire. He can call Uber. Hey, mm -hmm. Amber, no problem. You don't have your ride? Oh, I got a car service or Uber. Let me hop on my Uber and uh, Uber app, and I'll send you an Uber. She's a celebrity. She got Uber herself. Amber, I'll sit out here and wait for Uber to arrive to take you so that you're safe. No one, when the car comes and picks you up, I'll hop in my car and leave. There are many other options besides bringing a 304 into your car, and now you're driving her home. She's thirsty. She's been through a bunch of athletes and other celebrities. She's 40 years old. And, and I have great sympathy for C.J. Stroud because when you wear your faith publicly like that, 
and, and you're an important asset in the entertainment industry, they're going to send things your way to pull you to their side of the road. And, and men are weak as it relates to women in that special place. And, 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 and I've said it you know, back when I was in the world, I, I figured this out, that if you want the best, if you're looking for sex and you want the best, you better get someone that's been in the gym. A virgin's not going to do it for you. And so uh, Amber Rose has been in the gym. and She's got a, a lot to offer. You know, uh, <laughs> as, as it relates, she's in shape. She knows what she's doing. She knows exactly how to do it. CJ, this is a, I, and just like you said, the appearance. Don't even create the appearance because now you've let the other sharks know, oh, there's a there's an opportunity here. Right. He thinks Amber Woods. You think Brittany Renner isn't somewhere sitting around going, oh, Amber Rose? <laughs> I'm, I'm a better 304 than Amber Rose. I I'm 10 years younger. Uh, you know, it, it's he's he sent out a bat signal. 304s, hop in my DMs. I'm the Christian that's gonna try to save you. It's a mistake, CJ, and, and it, it just calls into questions. All these young people that are looking up to you, uh, you know, are sitting there, think because I've been through that mindset. I, I've been there where you look around and you say, well, oh, uh, Michael Jordan and them, they're all hanging out at strip clubs, and there are, you know, who are Patrick Ewing and all. I, <laughs> I remember I met. There was some woman in Atlanta, I met her at an ESPY's party. She worked at a strip club in Atlanta and they called her the Michael Jordan of sex. And I can remember meeting her and was like, what gym do you practice at? Can I, can I come to your gym? <laughs> and it's like Patrick Ewing and all these other guys are calling you the Michael Jordan of sex. It's very dangerous and, and, and I, I, I tell guys all the time the only way to really protect yourself is don't put yourself in harm's way. Right. And, and he, you, you can think you're as strong as you, as you want to be, but you're really not that strong. You're just right. one bad decision away from having a relapse. And again, it's why I don't go, I don't even, I don't even look at the McDonald's arches anymore because I just keep my head down. I don't even look at the arches because I know I could relapse at any moment. I'm always going to be an alcoholic as it comes to the filet of fish. But anyway, uh, I, you got any further thoughts? Yeah, I just think all men, period, should be very careful when they're alone with the lady. You know, is this worth the risk? If this is very innocent and you're just taking her home, it's not worth the risk of putting yourself in a position for her to say anything or anyone else to say anything. I think men have to be very careful. I think it was Billy Graham who wouldn't, as a pastor, would not meet with women alone because, or with the door shut because how it looked. And you put yourself in a position for a woman to say anything. I had a foster daughter when I was married, he, my husband never took her anywhere without someone else being in the car. This wasn't to say that, you know, he would do anything to her or she would try to make up anything. It just didn't look right. This wasn't his natural child. Don't put yourself in the position for anybody to even create a story. So I think men just have to be very careful in general. Um, you know, on how they carry themselves. Even as a woman, I don't just go on random dates. You're not going to see me with someone just because I was hungry or just because, you know, I needed a ride. I'm not doing that. And so people have to be really careful about their reputation and the things that they allow to happen or the positions they allow themselves to be in. It's funny. I'm Good. And thank you, Shamika. Uh, great job. Uh, we'll see you later this week. I'll, I'll wrap up the show with just a personal story. Uh, just this last week, I, I, I was in a position where I created confusion because of my paranoia. Uh, so, you know, I bought this house and I'm getting it renovated. And I, I got this new contractor. It's doing a great job. And, and 
he has a, uh, not a designer, someone that's helping me, woman that's helping me with uh, the furniture and just the way, the finishing touches on the house or whatever. This is her, her job. They have a relationship, he and this woman. And so uh, she wanted to come to the studio and she wanted to come to uh, where I live now to see what furniture I have now that will fit in my new house and all this. I created confusion because in a text string between the three of us, I said uh, something about like, uh, well, you can connect with Tiffany, my assistant, she can help you out with coming to the studio and looking at how much, because I'm getting a studio put in my home or whatever, and I want some consistency. And, and then I was talking about she wanted to come to my house, and I was like, well, if the, the new contractor, who I, I won't say his name, but you know, if he can't come, I'll have Tiffany uh, meet you at my house or where I currently live, and blah, blah, blah. It was all confusing because I, I said so many different things. They didn't understand that I was saying, like, I can't meet with this woman alone at my house. And so if your boyfriend's not available to come with you, I'll have Tiffany meet us there as well because I can't be, and again, I didn't say this. And so they got all confused with the time and, and what I was actually communicating. But it was just out of my sincere paranoia not to put myself in a position or put the woman in a position where she remotely felt uncomfortable or where anybody could say anything about me. But again, that's how careful we have to be as men. And, and it, certainly I do. And, and it's not that I'm perfect, because I'm not. Because <laughs> I'm, just, I'm not perfect, you know. I, 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 uh, I don't go out and socialize a lot. I went out and socialized this weekend and had a few drinks and, and, and you know, nothing happened, but I wasn't as careful as I normally am because I, I was in a social mood. And anyway, I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I'm trying to say I put in, I'm making efforts to be perfect. And that's what we all need to do as men. And, and I, I guess I say all that to say, Come to roll call because we'll talk about this type of stuff at roll call. You know, as men, how do we protect ourselves? How do we put ourselves? This is one. Of, the whole C.J. Stroud thing comes down to uh, putting yourself in a position where you can stand on righteousness and truth. Because they try, they use your sin to silence you. And so C.J. Stroud doesn't realize what he just did. See, the next time he stands up after a game and starts professing Jesus Christ, people are going to hear that and they're going to go, didn't I just see you with Amber Rose, a 40-year-old, 304? D didn't I just see that? And, and, oh, and you're the guy professing Jesus. And, and I'm not saying it's a fair attack, but that's what's going to happen. And that's why you were put in that position. So you can be silenced and ignored and called a hypocrite. CJ, whoever's mentoring CJ, help a brother out. Help a brother out. 40-year-old Amber Rose with her reputation as a whore. Not in your car. You, you want... Minister to her at the softball game, at the baseball game, have at it. Leaving the event with her right after uh, the, spending the Super Bowl with the Kardashians, not the look you want. Uh, anyway, we'll be praying for you, keeping you in our thoughts. It's a difficult struggle. 23 years old with all that attention and money and free time. It's hard, brother. It's a hard path. Uh, all right, uh, we'll play some tomorrow. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Coming off the breakdown, standing in line for freedom. Look for a breakout, feeling like a stand off, nothing in life like freedom. Came like a fighter, striking like a ladder, making all this moves for freedom. I want freedom. No negotiation, my system, no relationship.
Conversation we all just want to have freedom Sitting on a corner, never been alone I'll break my back for freedom Bless, we are living, get back We are receiving all the season We all want to be free We want freedom I just want, I wanna be I just want 